Good afternoon and welcome to the Buffalo Journal. I'm Lance Tailfeathers. On this edition of the Buffalo Journal, native people living in cities across the country are faced with a very modern problem. How to live in today's times and not lose their native heritage. We will see how one Cree Indian living in Calgary deals with this modern dilemma. We also have a review of a recent Indian movie which has brought an old story to life. But first, the culture of the prehistoric Plains Indian was a legacy of survival in a harsh environment. The many buffalo jumps throughout North America give insight into the lives of these Indians. The Buffalo Journal's Rick Tailfeathers takes us on an exploration of the past. More than 150 years ago, the Great Plains of North America was spotted with herds of buffalo. They roamed by the thousands. Their thundering hooves could be heard for miles around. The American Indian hunted the buffalo for centuries, long before the first Europeans ever set a foot on North American soil. So important was the buffalo to the Indian's survival that when it almost became extinct in the 18th century, the Indian race too nearly died out. The Plains Indian was almost totally dependent on the buffalo for food, shelter, and clothing. Everything was used for something. Very little of the buffalo was left behind, only the bones. It's these ancient remains that tell the true story of what happened way back in time. It's a fascinating story. The hunting technique used by those early hunters was an ancient one. They drove the herds of buffalo over a cliff called a buffalo jump. This method of hunting buffalo, according to archaeological studies, goes back 6,000 years, maybe longer. The hunt was a communal one that was carefully planned. When the herd was located, scouts dressed in the robes of the buffalo slowly creeped up to the unsuspecting prey. Meanwhile, other hunters dressed in the robes of coyotes also crept up to the herd. This was a diversion tactic so the buffalo would not notice the drivers who are working toward their positions. Sometimes this would take hours, even days. At the right time, when the herd could be driven in the direction of the cliff, the drivers make their move. They would jump up waving their robes. Once the buffalo began stampeding, they were systematically driven over the cliff to their death. When the kill was over, the men, women, and even children assisted in the butchering. If the hunt was successful, the food could last for months. There are many buffalo jumps across the Great Plains. Some of them have long been idle, since the last herds were killed off in 1880 by fur traders. This buffalo jump, located in the foothills on the Bullhorn Coulee west of Cardston, Alberta, was used by the Blood Indians as late as the 19th century. The remains of the buffalo can still be found under the ground surface at the bottom. Not far from the Bullhorn Buffalo Jump lives one of its most avid fans, a neighbor to the jump for more than 40 years. John Tallow is a collector in antiques and artifacts. He's been studying buffalo jumps for most of his life. His collection of arrowheads is one of the best privately owned anywhere. Bullhorn Pomibiscan, the name I understood came from, there's a buffalo jump just up west here. And apparently when they killed their buffalo, they had these boiling pits. And the Indians, natives at that time, had to acquire some sort of fat to go with their uh, dried meat, their pemmican, their choke cherries, crushed choke cherries. And buffalo are not too fat. They only get very little fat on them. So in order to get fat from them, they broke the bones. They broke because buffalo bones are awfully big. 
and they'd break them and they'd put them in these buffalo boiling pits and the marrow would melt out of the boiling water would come to the top, they'd let them cool off and when it's cold they'd skim that fat off the, ta off the top and that's how they acquired their fat and that's why they named it uh, uh, bullhorn because it's a jump and then their grease, the fat, Pomipiska. That jump, well, right across there's that meadow. There's a meadow there. And they had a pretty good campground there. You can tell if you walk along the bank. And all this silt is built up down about five or six feet, some places deeper. You can see the bone, the buffalo bones sticking out. And, you know, some of their fire pits. There might be a few rocks still in the bank. But having all these floods, see, that's all covered over by silt. And the same with the, right next to it. In another part of the foothills is another buffalo jump that is much more developed than Bullhorn. The Head Smashed In Buffalo Jump is located near Fort McLeod, Alberta. Most scientific information indicates it was one of the most widely used by prehistoric Indians. The most recent finds date back nearly 6,000 years. Head Smashed In is a popular tourist attraction visited by hundreds of people every year. Declared a World Heritage Site the interpretive center was painstakingly built into the side of the cliff. Its four levels tell the tale of many hunts. Linda Eaglespeaker is one of the native tour guides here. You actually go back into the past when you come here. You can go all the way up to the top and see the actual cliff side itself where the buffalo went over. You can see the drive line systems, guides, interpretive guides that'll be here well versed in their culture and their traditions and their language. They'll be able to bring you through this entire building and give you an idea of what it was like to live a long, long time ago. You actually go back into the past. When you come down into the building, you come down to level one, which is called Napi's world, the old man's world. That is our Blackfoot creation level. Our Blackfoot creation is extensive. We could go on and talk for days and days about Blackfoot creation, but basically it is the world, the elements, fire, water, and air, the vegetation, the animals, and human beings next. This is what you'll find on level one. When you come down to level two, you'll have an idea of what it was like for the first people to live there. There's a buffalo hide teepee on that level that's very small. And the reason for that is because in those days we traveled around with dogs from one place to the other. We depended on them for our lifestyle. That teepee, because of its size, pulling that dog driveway from one place to the other. In those days, it was a very, very hard job for our people to survive. We gathered here in the fall time. We were here as Blackfoot people in this area in the fall time. Winter time, we were way down near the Yellowstone River. Spring time, Cypress Sweet Grass Hills. Summer time, almost all the way up to Edmonton. The reason we're doing this is because we're following our food, the buffalo and the buffalo are following their natural migration. Then when you come down, you'll be in level three, which is called buffalo jump. That level tells you about the dynamics of the jump itself, how it was done. Young boys dressing up in hides, using scents, animal scents, their scents to move the herd, bring them from that gathering basin down through the driveline system and over the cliff. But that whole process took a long time. It would take you anywhere from five to six days to bring the buffalo from that large valley through that driveline system, through those piles of rocks, and over the cliff. Not like in the movies where they say that it's the buffalo jump happened, they stampeded, and that was the end of that. When people come here, they get an idea of how exactly it was done, how organized it was. Next on the Buffalo Journal, we meet a weekend warrior.
It's bright lights, fancy cars, and high buildings. Life in the fast lane. Hardly the kind of life for Canada's Aboriginal people. But it is the home of thousands of native people across Canada. Here in Calgary, there are nearly 10,000 natives, the population of a big reserve, and the numbers seem to be increasing. Much of the urban Indian population has left its culture behind back on the reservation. But here in Calgary, one of Alberta's major industrial centers, lives an Indian who is unique among his peers. Alvin Manitopius, a Cree Indian from his Saskatchewan reserve, is fighting a 20th century battle to live in mainstream society without losing his rich and colorful Indian heritage. Although he may be in the forefront of government administration and taking his place with department heads in the castles of glass, he is still Indian through and through. That's the way he wants it. Alvin has a nine to five job working in the core of urban life. He works with the government. The commitments of such a lifestyle are often pretty stressful for an Indian who has migrated to the city. But he's found a way to survive all that and remain Indian. He's adapted his lifestyle to the modern world. In the sense, he has a foot in each of the two worlds. It's Friday evening. Alvin is on his way to a powwow in Hobima, about two hours north of Calgary. It's here at the powwow that this Indian is most comfortable. You see Alvin take his native culture very seriously. He is a traditional dancer and loves to kick back and enjoy the beat of his Indian heritage. The positive energies he feels is a source of strength. Because there's a lot of pressures involved in the type of work that I do. Uh, there's deadlines and you have to be on time and and certain things involved and when I'm going out traveling attending powwows you know I can forget about all of the those kinds of pressures and I can just enjoy myself and attending the ceremonies and powwows it's sort of like a renewal process where you um, you feel good about participating you feel good about life and because you're out there celebrating life and it counterbalances the negative aspects of white man society working in the cities and so forth. Right from, right from the head to the foot, every part of the regalia has a certain meaning. And it varies from tribe to tribe. And a lot of the uh, basic meanings have been, have been lost. We have many younger people today who are dancing, but they don't realize the significance of uh, parts of our regalia. For example, a traditional dancer would wear uh, the hair of a mountain goat that symbolizes the sure-footedness of the animal and that's what we wear when we dance in the old days the dancers used to wear deer hooves and there's only certain warriors that had the, the right to to make the noise to wear the noise makers and they wore deer hooves but today everybody wears bells and it's mainly to keep in time to the beat of the drum. Alvin Manitopius has a strong belief that the Indian culture will survive the 20th century. He lives his life on a fine line between the past and the present, between the fast action of urban life and the laid back passionate lifestyle of the Pawa Trail. And somewhere in that broad spectrum, he has found himself, he is an Indian surviving the 20th century. Coming up on the Buffalo Journal, War Party.
Wake up, old man. Wake up. I did it. Good mother, I did it. I made great medicine. Let the bastard let my bloody man work now. Do the great medicine say anything about us? Indian movies showing native people as winners are few and far apart. Most show the Indian as a villain and hardly ever portraying the positive elements. Hollywood tends to like that kind of Indian. Nobody wants more trouble. Your friend just made a big mistake, sonny! You know. But recently, a new Indian movie told a different story. War Party, a release by Hemdale with Billy Worth and Tim Sampson shows a page of Indian history from a different perspective. A story of what was and what could be. It had the audience at the edge of their seats. The reenactment of an Indian battle between the Blackfeet and the U.S. Cavalry at Milk River in 1883 was the focus of the story as we find out in this video clip. In War Party, a new release from Hemdale, a small Montana town decides to reenact the battle at Milk River using Indians from the local Blackfeet reservation. Like the real thing, Ben. It is. It's great. What begins as a dramatic tourist attraction soon unleashes a battle cry that had been silent for a hundred years. Three Blackfeet warriors, played by Kevin Dillon, Billy Worth, and Tim Sampson, are caught in a real battle after the reenactment turns into mayhem. Their flight from racist lynchers takes them to the Rocky Mountains, to a vigil on Chief Mountain. One of the leading roles is played by Billy Worth, who himself is part Indian. He makes these comments. The Indian and the white man really don't know much about each other. You know, I mean, in the, in the small towns across the country where the Indians live and on the reservation, they're pretty much isolated. You know, occasionally you get people crossing over into the reservation area and all, but on the whole in America, um, most Americans just know what they read about in history books. They don't, they don't, they don't, they haven't met Indians people, so they don't realize that they're just like them, that they're real people. Sonny, Sonny, I need four names before you guys gotta die. Yeah, how many guys die on that side, Howard? 35. They lose 30. That's what we agreed, huh? Okay. Well, they got the guns. <laughs> Louis, stand and skitty. You guys ride around for about five minutes and fall off. What? Sonny? I don't wanna die. Please? And when I first read War Party, I knew right away that it was a film I wanted to do, right from the beginning. Um, what attracted me was, it was a movie about Indians, and it depicted them as real people, and uh, it was an exciting film because there was action in it, and I like, uh, I like riding horses, I like um, being in the outdoors. Another Indian actor who played a leading role in the movie was Tim Sampson, the son of Will Sampson, who gained prominence in the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Although War Party was his first big film, Samson was the finest. Uh, we'll try to encourage and promote Indian uh, actors, writers, and stuff to get involved more in the media. Because you know, there's a, it's a, it's a door, uh, uh, a field that really you rarely see, really, rarely see uh, Indian people in. And, and there's, there's an opportunity out there to get involved with. And we can um, tell our side of the story now. You know, so you know, a lot of people are getting into the uh, native viewpoint you know what took place you know years ago or contemporary stories you know. tim could you tell us how you got involved in the film industry um i got into business by uh, traveling with my father you know will sampson and then hanging out with him and going on his films and stuff and uh, you know getting extra parts riding horses and stuff and um, eventually i just started you know following horses and doing this and that and <clears throat> started getting into stunt work and and I stayed a stuntman for about 14 years now. And I never did really care for acting or anything, but when War Party came around, I seen a, an opportunity there, so I went for it. And then War Party's my first acting job. Yeah. 
there's an American Indian Talent Registry in uh, Hollywood. You know, when the Indian shows come to town, you know, they're looking for Indians, they contact you, and so you set up an audition for you and stuff. So that's how you know I got hooked up with your party. But I really wanted to work on it, doing anything, you know, because the, the, the thing subjects that it, it dealt with, dealt with. Although War Party is a fiction story, it makes a statement about how America has treated Indians for the past two centuries. And certainly, it reflects a harshly real picture of America today. It has much to offer Canadian audiences. Last month, the Buffalo Journal's trivia question was, which tribe signed Treaty No. 7 and where? In September of 1877, Treaty No. 7 was signed at the Blackfoot Crossing, east of Calgary. The agreement was reached between the British Crown and the Blackfoot, Blood, Sarsi, Pagan, and Stony Indian tribes. For $5 a year, the tribes surrendered thousands of square miles of land to the British Crown and agreed to peace under British rule. In turn, the government promised to supply the Indians with medical services, food, and education. The signing granted the Indians special status under British rule for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the river flows. Aboriginal rights in southern Alberta are all based on Treaty No. 7. Today's trivia question is this. In 1912, a famous Indian won a very important event at the first Calgary Stampede. Who was that Indian, and what did he win? We will have the answer for you next time. In our letters to the producer, Jeff Forrest of Coaldale writes that issues involving Native people have been ignored for far too long. Hopefully this is the beginning of more programming showcasing Native talent and ideas. We welcome your letters to the Buffalo Journal. Please address them to the Buffalo Journal, P.O. Box 1120, Lethbridge, Alberta. And the postal code for that is T1J4A4. That is it for today's show. On behalf of the rest of the staff, I'm Lance Telfeathers. So long. The Buffalo Journal is a program produced by the native people of Western Canada. It looks at the culture, history, and contemporary lifestyles of Canada's Aboriginal people.